All right, let's pray. Lord, in your name and for your sake, we gather here to study your word. Pray that you would fill us with your spirit. We lift up our voices with gratitude and praise for, I want to say, for the Univoce tour that happened, for Kevin's visit with, uh, with Austin, with the Good Neighbor Place and the ministries they've been able to do and continue to expand in. Pray for continued expansion there. Uh, we praise you that the shower and laundry trailer can come up potentially more frequently and for less. Um, we have the beams up at the church. Christine's mom turned 87, and we're thankful also just for Nolan and Tabitha and their continued excitement to be a part of our church family. You give us more to be thankful for than we can imagine. Mm -hmm. We also have the opportunity to lift up our voices in our requests. I want to pray for Mac and his unspoken requests. Continue to bless Salt Ministries that they would be able to come up uh, more frequently. Pray for the Mergenthaler's kids up in Maine that they would find housing and soon. Pray for Mike and his wife who are have, have COVID. Pray for Corre and for uh, the woman that has connected us with Publix. Please heal him from his fever. Also, just pray for Sandy. She would continue to connect and love coming to our church. And also, please be with Lou and Connie in their study. Um, God, we give you our time. We give you our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. So um, I want to just ask real quick, how many of you were able to continue watching what we started last week? All right. <laughs> and we'll continue where we left off last week i figured that probably was what was going to happen because that's uh, typical <laughs> Not but, hours of the day. it never is i understand uh so where we were last week just to kind of quickly review we talked about jesus being the only truly revolutionary uh, politician in history uh he mentioned how everyone says some version of the same thing and then Jesus flips the whole thing upside down and gives this radically alternative way of being human. He overturns all the power systems, all the principles of the world. And instead of it's me, instead of being me being greater than you, it's always reframed as choosing to put others before yourself. Um, it's almost like when we come into Matthew and then when we specifically get into the Sermon on the Mount, that it's a reversing of Genesis. We go from when we had oneness in Genesis devolving into blame when Eve blamed or when Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent uh, to being reversed from oneness to blame and shame reversed to oneness once again. And they mentioned how the cross really was the living out in that just critical moment in history, what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, especially in putting others first. He talked about the entirety of the Bible almost being like a miniature, miniature Bible. And we'll get into that just a little bit more here. But we're kind of setting up a further study on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, by understanding how Matthew gets there. And they're kind of walking us through that here. So we're going to start where we left off. And we'll be talking tonight, especially about two words. And that would be the word kingdom and the word fulfill. The word kingdom and fulfill before we um, get into the specifics between Matthew 1 and 4. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share that with you uh, right now. So I'm going to go to that. Oh, whoops. That's the wrong thing. Let me get back to the correct thing because that would not be good. All right, there we go. Sharing the screen, sharing that, sharing sound. All right, and here we go. So we'll listen to about 10 minutes roughly of it right now, maybe a little bit more. This is why the word kingdom is such a centrally important word. For example, in the New Testament, here? in the Gospels, but especially you up in the Gospel bit? of Matthew. Mm -hmm. yeah. More than any other of the four. Yeah, more than Mark, Luke, and John, we find this emphasis on kingdom, kingdom, mm -hmm. kingdom. And 
so I think the title, Kingdom nope. Manifesto, I think it's a great <laughs> title. Yeah. I think it is very much in line with the fact that Jesus is subtly, and in some cases not so subtly, undermining, as you're saying here, yeah. the systems of the world. Yeah, I mean, this, right. this is, and I don't want to be misunderstood on this, the Sermon on the Mount is radically political, but yeah. not in the ways that we might initially think of. It's radically political by being radically apolitical. Yeah, by being so dissimilar that it doesn't fit into any of yeah. these. There are people on both sides, just to use the politics thing here for a second, there are people on both sides of any given political spectrum that will try and claim Jesus. Yeah. No political system gets to claim Jesus. Jesus he's, defies all of it. He's the infinite, eternal, illimitable God of the universe. He came, and I love mm. your language there, as the, as the me, as the I, as the I am, yeah. to prioritize the use. Isn't that amazing? That's oh, going to be incredible. I That's can't amazing. Wait. So, so Jesus, Jesus, you guys, I, I just have to, I just have to say this from my heart, pastorally. In fact, if you're a follower of Jesus, one of the things about following Jesus is that Jesus transcends all political systems and political ideologies. Mm. As a follower of Jesus, you cannot sell your soul and your Christianity to the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, socialism, communism, monarchy, whatever you want to call any of it, you have to, with your Lord and Savior, with your King, Come on you have to ride, as it were, above the fray of all of what's happening the noise. in this world. The noise yeah. of the world. So Jesus transcends everything, and as followers of Jesus, we need to see what he's saying and say, we're with him. We're with him. Preach. That's who we're with. And not just followers in some sort of, you know, general sense or passive sense, but, but if there's a kingdom, and again, Jesus will speak, I mean, he'll use the word <clears throat> kingdom almost 10 times in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, who's the king? Yeah. He is the king. <laughs> That's so right. w when we say follower, you know, today on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, and, we have followers, but this is a very sort of facile, mm. simple way of yeah. being. Now, we're not followers of Jesus in that way. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeah. We are his subjects. Yeah. We are his citizens. Yeah. We are his creation. Mm. We are his friends. We are his younger brothers and sisters. There's a much stronger yeah. connection there. And the loyalty, the ideological, spiritual, political loyalty, whatever you want to call it, that we feel to Jesus, philosophical, has to trump and Trump isn't to. even a strong enough word. It has to transcend. Transcend. Thank you. Yes. Any competing loyalties that yeah. we might have That's to right. nations, yeah. political parties, political systems, economic mm, systems. Mm, come on. Okay. And that doesn't mean you can't have perspectives or opinions about those things. Well, you they will. Have, they have to be so yeah. subordinate yeah, that's right. to this larger yeah. thing that Jesus yeah. is doing in the world. That's right. So the title, <laughs> Kingdom Manifesto, is yeah. it's ambitious, yeah. but it's I think it's spot but on. The word kingdom... Uh, is a composition of two words, king and domain or dominion. So, so what we have going on with that word kingdom is we're essentially exploring the domain over which Jesus presides, yeah. right? In the, in the most immediate sense, the kingdom that he's birthing mm -hmm. with the Sermon on the Mount, the, the, the church. But then in a larger sense, Israel, locally, historically, he's called in Matthew's gospel, yeah. Herod says, hey, I want to worship the one who is the king of the Jews. Well, he's, he's not far off. He's, he's understanding what's going on here. The king of the world and of the universe, you use the language king of kings, lord of lords. He transcends all of it. And ultimately, there is only one, can I say it this way, one rightful ruler yeah. of the world and the universe. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. The language that we find in Matthew are phrases like the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Sometimes he just refers to it as the kingdom. And even gospel on several of the occasions, kingdom. the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of the son of man. So this was language that, that Matthew is purposefully driving at when he tells the story of Jesus. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all telling the story of Jesus mm -hmm. through their lens. Yeah. And for Matthew, it was hugely significant, mm -hmm. this emphasis on kingdom. In fact... The Sermon on the Mount, what we'll be studying, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, does, there's a corollary to it, or, you know, sort of a, a comparative similar sermon in the, in the Gospel of Luke, mm -hmm. not so much in John or Mark, but, but Matthew spends three chapters. I mean, 
by far, this is the longest sermon in the New Testament, right. and it's not close. Yeah. Right? Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Matthew sets forth his gospel as a teaching aid. Yeah. Right? He, in Matthew's mind, he's teaching you, well, not that he's teaching you, mm -hmm. he's allowing Jesus to teach you, but he's crafting <clears throat> his portrait of Jesus yeah. so that you will see Jesus as your instructor, as your teacher, as your mentor, and, and certainly, as we've already said, as your king. Yeah, yeah. But that language yeah. is purposeful. Yeah. And, and by the way, um, for those of you who are studying with us, David just said that it's the longest sermon in the New Testament, in Scripture, in fact, unless you consider the book of Deuteronomy to be a sermon. Okay, but it's the longest sermon in Scripture. It's the longest record of Jesus' sermon. It's only 20, about 25, 2,600 words at an average reading speed of 200 words a minute, which is average. That's not a fast reader. It's not a slow reader. You can read the thing in 15 minutes, and we would encourage you to read it preparatory to joining us for part two yeah. of this series. Do it Brother, over just read it, over just read it, 15 over. minutes, just read it. Just read it every day, read it every day, over and over again. Take 15 minutes, read the Sermon on the Mount. Just read it over and over again, become familiar with it, so that as we go through this series together, we will just be pushing buttons and triggers in your mind and you'll be, oh yeah, and your familiarity with the text will make it much more easily and rapidly comprehensible as we go through this series. Ty, one of the, I think, smartest things that I ever did, and it was actually kind of serendipitous the way that it happened, but early on in my Christian experience, I think this was maybe one of the smartest things I did as a brand new Christian, was I memorized the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, memorized it in the New King James Version. I was a believer of maybe six months, and somebody just, I actually heard somebody say, that the Sermon on the Mount, and I think we'll get into this, is like a mini Bible. Yeah. A mini Bible. It's basically the Old Testament and the New Testament all squashed together, the essence of it. And that's going to be fun to unpack. But it's gonna, it would be very difficult to memorize the Bible, yeah. right? <laughs> Genesis to Revelation. But it occurred to me, even as a believer of less than a year, well, I probably will never memorize the Bible. Certainly won't. But I could memorize three chapters, and I yeah, did it. Yeah. And I, I tell you, Ty, it became so mooring, so grounding to me. And so when you're encouraging people to read it, read it, read yeah, it, read it, yeah. you know, if you're a little more ambitious, consider memorizing it. Mm -hmm. Because what's happened for me over the years is that I will hear things in the rest of Scripture that will, that will echo and reverberate off of that chamber right. of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, we're, we're going to get into I memorized it, it by accident. I, not, <laughs> yeah, seriously, not as, not as a goal I'm going to memorize it, which is a great thing to do, and, and you should consider doing that. I memorize it by accident by doing what I just encourage you to do. I just, just read it over it and over. over. I was just like, again. whoa, 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 whoa. If you have a little more time, there are lots of commentaries on the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospel of Matthew as well, commentaries. But we want to highly recommend to you I've got it right here. a specific book that is, in David's opinion, my opinion, the very best commentary on the Sermon on the Mount ever written. Amen. It will blow your mind if you've not read it. And it's a short book. Look, how, how many pages is that it's book? It's like 120 pages. This book is called world. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing by Ellen White. 150 pages. It was written over 100 years ago. It's as relevant this moment as it was back when it was written. It's timeless. It's amazing. Line by line, sentence by sentence. I basically underlined the whole book, which yeah, makes same. underlining <coughs> basically pointless. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you, if you want, can't get your hands on a copy of that book, you can just type into the Google search engine. Um, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, Ellen White PDF, and you can just read it on your screen or print I've out a PDF. I've read this book so many times, yeah. Ty. It's my favorite of all of her books. She wrote many books. This is my favorite. Yeah. And what you said is so true. It's a line by line, verse by verse commentary. Yeah. And the degree, I, I think after I mem was memorizing the Sermon on the Mount and reading this book, again, it was mm. so totally grounding yeah. to my larger Christian experience because it's you cut out the middleman. This is just you and Jesus, right? right? You, 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 and not that it's not great to have a Paul or a Peter or something. This is, Jesus is talking to you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. To you, because yeah. I want to be a disciple. Ty wants to be a disciple. You want to be a disciple. And the Sermon on the Mount was from Jesus to his disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, yeah. if, if I had to select three chapters in the whole of Scripture, I could just select any random chapters, and these would be the ones that 
that I would have access to all the time or that I could memorize or that I could know, you know, perfectly and intimately. It yeah. would be these chapters. Yeah, it would have to be. Because it, it really is be. the summary yeah. of the whole yeah. corpus yeah. of Scripture. Yeah. It is the Bible in miniature. We can say it like this. The Sermon on the Mount is not a one-off sermon. Hmm. It's, it's, not, it's not a topic in a lineup of other topics. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus essentially giving us a summary of Torah, yes. a, a summary of the Law and the Prophets, a summary of what is called the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus essentially is saying, this is what's going on in the writings of Moses and all the Correct. other prophets. And it, it's, it's, it's essentially a Bible in miniature. It is the Bible in miniature. We all right, I'm going to stop and stop that for just a moment there. And just maybe we can unpack some of that together. Some real key things he said. Jesus undermining the systems of the world in favor of the system of heaven. Transcending all political system and ideologies. Uh, loyalty to Jesus has to transcend any competing loyalties in the world. Talked about the kingdom being the king plus the domain over which Jesus presides being the church, Israel, or the world. Um, Sermon on the Mount being like a miniature Bible. And um, so, and then he talked about thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Uh, I can concur, as you know, um, memorizing the Sermon on the Mount is a pretty life-changing thing. And a really, really was a good exercise for me as well. But I wanted to ask some questions here. Um, one thing I noticed, he talked about the alliance of people to Jesus being mixed somewhat with alliance to systems of the world. So kind of the temptation to ally my Christian experience with, say, being uh, a Republican or a Democrat or whatever it may be. I'm wondering, why does that happen? Any thoughts on why do we, why are we so tempted to do that? Well, we connect with, we have a relationship with Jesus, but we still live in this world. Mm -hmm. We have to interact with the forces around us, political and otherwise, in some way. Sure. I guess the question is, why do we sometimes mix the two up? Like my alliance to Jesus and my alliance to a political system or world system somehow are almost synonymous in some people's minds. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, is like you said, he has to transcend all of that. But what right. what's behind the temptation, I guess, is what I'm asking to mix the two up. Oh, I want that's to a tough question. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm just thinking that it might be that some of us are not as connected to Christ as we should be. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just a thought. Okay. I was going to say this basically the same thing. Our focus on Christ maybe weakens a bit. And with the political um, thing all around us, it, our focus there grows. Mm -hmm. And so... It's more thrown in our face, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing is that, that America claims to be a Christian nation. And so political parties try to use that mm -hmm. as, a, as a base for political power, assuming that only one group of people has that perspective. And mm -hmm. so we start painting each other in the corners by name calling mm -hmm. and uh, I have this and you don't, or you, when you do this, you're not Christian and I am. Oh boy. And it, it's all really about power. Mm -hmm. And we'll use anything we can uh, as we're seeing in, in our political system for people to be reelected. And they use Christianity in, in both parties as an avenue of control. And so we get caught up in that. And so 
I, I like what she just said. We we don't really understand what Christianity is because Jesus was completely against all of that, and he talked about it. Right. Mm. I think um, <clears throat> everything comes down to one thing: is self. It's all about self, and it's the selfish motives. That's why people are competing and fighting against each other. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if it's about self, ultimately, what can they do? They can manipulate our feelings even easier. Definitely. Right. Right. You know, I, I, my wife and I have had a joke over the years. Every time it seems like there's a campaign that comes that rolls around, it seems like you have parties that their whole modus operandi is who can scare grandma the most. And it's kind of, you know, it's it's kind of just been a running joke for cycle after cycle after cycle. And it's sad to see how easily systems of the world can manipulate our feelings of fear uh -huh. or our desire of power. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Someone mentioned power. I think the other converse of that is fear. Uh -huh. The devil manipulates both. Yes. And the truth of the matter is, is what is it, the ultimate with Christ? Ultimately, he has all the power. Mm -hmm. And ultimately with Christ, there is no fear. And remember the Pharisees did the same thing. Yeah, they did. They, they, they called names. I mean, they called the Christians, they, well, they, they called Jesus healing by the power of demons. <clears throat> they yeah. called him the demon. And uh, so, you know, it is all about self. It's all about self and it's all about power. Mm -hmm. And they use that because they wanted to keep their political power. And mm -hmm. they accused anybody who didn't agree with their understanding yeah. of scripture as mm -hmm. being demon possessed. Mm -hmm. oh. Very good points. Yeah. You, you know, also see exclusiveness with, with the, uh, the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, how about with the Adventist church? Mm. Uh -oh. We have the message. We have this. We have that. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful that we don't fall into the same trap as mm -hmm. the Pharisees, Sadducees. Absolutely. You, you just made it real. It, you don't have to look at the political systems of the world. You can look within your own feelings within your own denominations and be just as guilty yes. of uh, being manipulated uh, of having your fears you know part of the reason we did revelation for a while especially going through first you know chapter 13 was we've got to address a fear-based look at the end times you might remember the little graphic i put up with the guy that looked worried looking at the you know, mm -hmm. looking at the cliff next to him versus the guy who's looking at the expanse and enjoying the view. And part of the reason we went through that is because I've come across so many people that I feel have the devil's manipulated their fear at the end of times versus we haven't learned to look at the love of Jesus, which, by the way, is why we segued into this on the Sermon on the Mount, too. Um, well, Oh. Pastor, I, even some of our leading evangelists uh, admit that most people come to Jesus out of fear. Fear mm -hmm. of being burned up, fear of being excluded, fear of, of not really doing what God wants us to do. So, And so we think we can do things to earn his approval mm -hmm. so that we don't get burned up. Mm -hmm. And you know, mo most good evangelists will tell you that that tactic is works, uh, and people don't really learn to have a walk with Jesus un until th they really have that that daily communication and study and prayer, um, uh, you know, on a daily basis. But we come in because we're scared that we're going to be. I, I remember sermons, listening to sermons by the evangelists when I was a little kid in the tent. One day when money will be thrown into the street and nobody will pick it up, you know, all those kind of scaring tactics. And it gets your attention and it does make you stop and think. 
but that's not why we that's not what we're supposed to come to Christ about. Mm -hmm. Heard one recently say say mm -hmm. our money will be no better than toilet paper <laughs> pretty soon. And you know, and, and stuff of like that. It's almost like evangelism for a long time just was like fire, it was fire insurance. <laughs> Well, for lack of, for lack of a better <laughs> putting it, um, anyway, that just came to mind. Yeah. So, this approach, you know, allying your Christianity with a system of the world, or even to little subsystems within the church itself, it can be a very dangerous, very dangerous road to go down. And that connection. Christine, you said it right on the right on the head there. That that connection to Christ better supersede mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Um, yeah. If it doesn't, if you're not yourself in the Word, if mm -hmm. you're not walking with Jesus and with your eyes open mm -hmm. uh, and remembering, it's His character of love. It's not, you know, ultimately the the Bible is about His character of unfailing love. Mm -hmm. um, that has to stay at the forefront uh, because what does love cast out? Fear. fear. That's what the Bible says. Perfect love casts out fear. Mm -hmm. If it does that, then I'm not going to get fear manipulated. Mm -hmm. If I remember that Jesus is on the throne, mm -hmm. it, it just, it takes care of a lot of that. Yeah. What do you think about the statement, by the way? He said, Sermon on the Mount's like the essence of the Old Testament and New Testament squashed together. Mm -hmm. How'd that strike you? Mm -hmm. Talking about rather deep understanding of it and the principles behind it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it that way, honestly. Mm -hmm. Having read it bunches of times, they've memorized it. To, to think of that as a summary of scripture was pretty, mm -hmm. I, that took me back a little bit. Well, when you, I, I guess, where is law and grace? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Old Testament tends to, to focus on the things uh, that we think of as, as the law. Mm -hmm. And and then the New Testament tends to focus on on Jesus and the, and His mercy and His grace, mm -hmm. and and so and yet the law is is also included in that process. I just mm -hmm. never had thought of it that way. I thought I thought that was an interesting statement. Mm -hmm. it needs to fit together like a puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Law and grace. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to share one little clip here now. It's uh, less than four minutes. Can we look at that real quick? This is the next big word he says that is important. We mentioned kingdom. I'm going to look at this word fulfill. So let's check this out, what he has to say about that now. I mentioned already that one of Matthew's favorite words, and of course, one of Jesus' favorite words that Matthew, you know, honed in on and tuned into is the idea of kingdom. Mm -hmm. Another one of Matthew's favorite words, for sure, is the word fulfill. Yeah. I mean, just over <clears throat> and yeah. over and yeah. over. He's insistent, mm -hmm. right? This happened that it might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled, yeah. that it might be fulfilled. And before we get to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount, several times in the lead up to that, in Matthew chapters, in Matthew chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, we mm. come across this, no, this notion of fulfill, fulfill, fulfill. And, and Matthew's telling a story. Mm -hmm. He's, well, Jesus is the one telling the story, and Matthew's recording that Jesus did specific things. His life followed a certain trajectory or pattern such that any Jewish reader, and it's important to bear in mind that of all the Gospels, mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have their own sort of features, their distinctive elements. You know, if I just started reading to you from one of the Gospels, you could almost certainly tie you know, most, you know, regular students of scripture could detect and say, that sounds like John. Oh, that sounds like Mark. Oh, that sounds like Luke. And you could detect, that sounds like Matthew. Yeah. And one of the features of Matthew's gospel is this idea of fulfill, 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 and that it has a Jewish element, very yeah. Jewish, written in a Jewish context by a Jewish person. 
to certainly a Jewish audience. What I mean by Jewish is people that were at least familiar mm -hmm. with the teachings of mm -hmm. the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. And in those leading chapters, the chapters one to four, Matthew is actually telling, and we'll get into this, the way he's telling the story of Jesus is that Jesus is living out. He's literally reenacting, gathering up and fulfilling in himself, mm -hmm. bodily, yeah. historically, narratively, the history of Israel. Yeah, this is crucial. And you're not going to understand the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, I'm going to make a big statement here. I don't think you're going to be able to fully understand the Sermon on the Mount if you don't understand how Matthew gets us there, how mm -hmm. Jesus gets us there in chapters one to four. And mm -hmm. I think we should spend some time mm -hmm. setting up the sermon yeah. because we'll spend the lion's share of our time in the sermon itself. Mm -hmm. But how do we get there? Yeah. So you're studying scripture with us. You're a note taker. Write down one of the words that, that David just used. Jesus is reenacting the history of Israel in the gospel of Matthew, specifically Matthews one through four, and then chapters five through seven. Jesus is new Israel in himself, a microcosm. He's Israel 2.0, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah, yeah, Jesus yeah, yeah, yeah. is essentially rewriting Israel's history with covenantal faithfulness. Whatever their failures were, to be in right relation, in covenant relation with God and with one another and with the nations, Jesus comes along and he is, in fact, the rewrite of Israel's covenantal script. He is wow. reenacting the history of Israel in himself. And then watch this, you guys. He's reenacting Israel's history in himself. And then what is he doing? He's reaching out and he's incorporating us in to that reenactment. Beautiful. He's in court. <laughs> David is in Christ. Israel's history rewritten. Ty is in Christ. Israel's history rewritten. You are in Christ rewritten as Israel's history. Now, Ty, what you just said there was so beautiful. And I think we're going to have to support that textually. Yes. Right? Like we've made the, we've made the case there, but what gives us the textual right to say these things? Yeah. That Jesus is Israel 2.0, that he's... All right, sorry about that. I missed my cutoff spot there. Big, big statement there. Mm. Jesus is reenacting the history of Israel in the gospel of Matthew. New Israel in himself, Israel 2.0. Mm -hmm. And he incorporates us into that reenactment and in Christ you are rewritten in Israel's history how do you how do you see Jesus as rewriting Israel's history in you personally I mean when you think about Abraham's calling in his life you think about Moses you think about David the three big figures really how do you see Christ rewriting Israel's history even in your own life I just think that's a really beautiful thought that curious how you would unpack that. <clears throat> I've got to ponder that. Yeah. That's deep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what about his calling? Let's, let's try Abraham's calling for a second. Can you feel like in your life, you were in a place away from God and God called you to himself to something really radical, quite frankly? Anyone identify with that? You know, when, when you've been, uh, when you've been a Christian in all your life and you've, you've been a part of this church all your life, you don't ever get the feeling that you came out of something that was so universal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you hear people say, I was called into this or to that. 
and I think that that becomes a it's a critical point for for those of us who grew up in the church because we have a different experience of not having to sacrifice to leave something that the majority uh, participated in to say I'm gonna I'm gonna make a turn in my life this way and uh, and yet you can be grown up in this church and still not know Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that happens so much because as Jack was saying, you know, we, we put our emphasis on the things that we know, we, we have the truth, we are this. And so we don't get to that point that someone who has not grown up knowing what we know has had to sacrifice you know, like in, in my family, my, my grandmother left, her, 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 her parents were Baptist people, Baptist ministers. Her, her, her brother-in-law was a Baptist pastor and she was, was really ridiculed for being baptized in, into our church. I never had to experience that because mm. I've, I've been sheltered in this all my life. And so we make these assumptions about Christianity because we've been in the church all of our lives. And so that's kind of a, a very deep question that you asked because I never had to think about it that way. Hmm. Yeah. But, but Mac, also, I think even if we have been in the church, even if we have been a part of this church, as, as long as we have not had that special walk with Christ, uh, we can be in the church, but not be of the church. Amen. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I also had the same uh, thing happen as uh, your grandma. I had two grandmothers who came into the Adventist church because of Call Porter and then because of meetings in Baton Rouge that they mm -hmm. were asked to come to. Their husbands said, if you are baptized into that church, we're gone. Mm -hmm. And they did. Both of them left. I only saw my one grandfather once. I never saw the other grandfather because he was, he was never there. Mm -hmm. But I, I can remember in my own life, Mac, and you probably had the same, same experience, that uh, I was drifting along. I was going with the flow. I wasn't really with it. And there was a time, and I've, I've shared this with the Sabbath school, but there was a time when a week of prayer at Southern Missionary College grabbed me, literally, it seemed like grabbed me by my hair and said, look, you are not what you are purporting to be on the outside you say you're mm -hmm. an Adventist. on the inside no way mm -hmm. and i knew mm -hmm. it i was drifting and it would have been very easy for me to drift right out of the church but that week of prayer changed my life mm -hmm. and it was very shortly after that that somebody that the picture is just below me came into my life and changed everything and it was all because I think I made that commitment. I made that, I rededicated. I was baptized when I was uh, 12. I was actually converted when I was 20, mm -hmm. almost 21. And, and I know that. It, I, I can tell you exactly. And I think, Jack, because, mm -hmm. and, and I, I hope I'm not going to say something too radical, but. <laughs> You? I, I, I believe <laughs> because we put more emphasis on joining the church than joining Christ. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's, that's not too radical. That's, right. that's hitting the nail on the head. Amen. Yeah, Amen. yeah I, I, I'm sitting here tracking with you, Jack. My, my story is not dissimilar at all. Mm. Just being drifting. And, and very close to drifting out mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and before i even knew it it wasn't like there was a, a conscious effort there wasn't a it, nobody did anything 
you know, it was just a constant drift before a different experience for me. It was an, another individual, but it was, it, it was, I, I can identify with, I almost feel like I identify with Moses' story a little bit in that sense. Mm-hmm. If we're talking about rewriting Israel's history, because here he was setting himself up to be something yeah. uh, that he really wasn't yet. And he had to pay a heavy price for that and go out in the wilderness before he was converted again at age 80 to go back and actually do what he was supposed to do. Mm. Um, and, you know, so I feel like in that sense, drifting off, having God honestly have to grab me by the head and shake me a little bit um, mm. and then coming back, um, you know, it, it, there's there's no big glowing story for me but it, it just coming coming back um i feel i identify with god rewriting his history in me too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, i mean we all had these we all have a story of some kind mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be dramatic yeah it, yeah. it just has to be find yeah. jesus somehow mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that just goes to show you that whether you were born into the faith or you joined from somewhere else, that there has to come that day, that point in your life when you say, I want Jesus for me. I want to know him. I want him to come and dwell within me and make that transformation that I need. That mm-hmm. day has to come for everybody, whether you were born in the church mm-hmm. Or not. Really. It has to be a conscious choice. I want this. Really. Yeah. Absolutely. I, was, mm-hmm. I wasn't born in the church or raised in the church, but I, I joined while I was uh, in my mid teens. And <laughs> I had, I, it just happened, I had friends who were Adventists before I joined the church. And to be honest, <laughs> If I were to go by their example, I would not have joined. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, they they did not impress me as Christians. Um, no, oh yes, it was it's sad, but yeah. I'm in the church. Yeah, it was from a conscious decision. Well, it was actually a car porter who came to our house selling books, and he he gave tracks, and you know we started studying my mom and myself. Mm. What, what did they impress you as? I, I really would be curious to know. You said they didn't impress you as Christians. What did they impress you as? Well, their actions, their behavior was just like everybody else. They just went to mm. church on Saturday. Yes, yes. And, and they would have other people for lunch at the table. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't get that picture of you know, that Christ-like behavior. I didn't see it. Yeah, Yeah, they would discuss people in a very negative way. And, you know, they all, well, some, especially a couple of them who felt that they were too sheltered and they just wanted to get out there and do what everybody else was doing. Yeah. But the world was pulling at them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pull at me. The grace of God is everybody. He's extended to everybody. That's a good thing. (laughs) Oh, yeah. All right. So next week, we're going to start diving into Matthew 1 through 4 and just continue. We'll get this all set up and um, then be able to start on the actual sermon itself. Um, I don't know that we'll get to the actual sermon next week because there's just so much to unpack setting up. But yours, by the way, tonight, I just want to say how blessed I am to just hear your stories, to hear how just a a snippet of how Israel's history was rewritten in your life. If you think about it between now and next week, just what the tie-ins are for you, um, I think it'd be really cool to start a meeting like that, just to hear one or two stories like that, because your testimonies, Jack, your testimony, Christine, yours, hopefully mine. Mac, uh, it, it bless, it's a blessing, and I appreciate those Steve. very much. Mm-hmm. Amen. And, and to know that we didn't all have to have 
an angel write something in the skies above us to know that we just somehow all of us a lot of us just took average roads seemingly average roads to Christ. there's no such thing as an average road in christ i'm not saying that but just from the outsiders and that those stories are legitimate it's always been a blessing to me to realize like you know what it didn't have to be dramatic it just had to be about jesus Mm. Yeah. Yeah. so hey let's have prayer um and then um i appreciate you all appreciate it uh, we'll again we're moving to kind of a hybrid in person online and then splitting off into separate groups uh so hopefully by next week we'll have that worked out how that'll work we just uh, didn't quite have the bandwidth to get it together this week so all right let's pray our Father, we thank you for our time tonight and for your Holy Spirit being with us. We thank you that you're rewriting history in all of us and that it's in Christ. And because it's in Christ, it's in us who have accepted you by faith. Be with us the rest of this week. Draw us nearer and nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have a good night, everybody. Good to good see night. you all. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.